In this video, we continue on from our previous discussion. Uh, in the previous lecture, we studied um, the use of the finite element method in a one-dimensional region, um, or let's say the use of the finite element method to solve a differential equation in a one-dimensional region. And uh, in that lecture, it was assumed that the differential equation had Dirichlet boundary conditions at the two endpoints. And now in this lecture, we're going to see what to do, what differences uh, we encounter if we have a Neumann boundary condition at one boundary. <clears throat> so uh, let's get started. Here is our uh, problem domain. And as before, um, we will take the leftmost node to be node zero, and then this will be node one, two, three, and so on. Now for this, um, uh, you have some freedom here as to what you want to consider the last two nodes to be. You could consider uh, this last interior node to be node n, in which case the very last node would be node n plus one. And that would be um, consistent with what we did before, and that's what I'll do in this lecture. Uh, but some people uh, would consider this last node to be uh, node n and number appropriately. But um, uh, we'll, we'll just stick with the same numbering that we had before, where um, this last interior node is n, and the very last node, the one at x equals l, is node n plus 1. We have the same exactly the same differential equation as before and we had the same boundary condition on the left boundary but now on the right boundary uh, we have uh, dy dx of l and this should not be a zero here uh, this should be uh, b but unfortunately let's see if i can uh, let's see if i can erase this um, i don't i don't I don't know if I can easily do that. I don't, uh, unfortunately, I don't have my pen with me, but just uh, this should be dy dx of L is equal to B, not zero, but B. Okay, so what we will do is multiply both sides of the equation by testing function T sub I, and we'll talk more about what T sub I is later, but we'll multiply by testing function T sub I and so when we do that, uh, this is what we get on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, of course, we still get zero. Then we will integrate both sides of the equation uh, from zero to L. And so this is what we will get on the left-hand side. And of course, when we integrate zero, we still get zero. So we still have zero on the right-hand side. <clears throat> now, this is similar to what we did before. Uh, this first integral will be attacked uh, using integration by parts. And so uh, we will let uh, ti of x be u and d squared y dx squared dx uh, will play the role of dv. And so du is dti dx dx and v is dy dx. And so now when we plug that into the usual integration by parts formula, we have uv uh, minus the integral of v du. And then of course everything else just comes down the integral uh, this integral comes down here and this integral comes down here and of course the zero on the right hand side comes down as well now we had a situation similar to this um, uh, in our previous analysis but now we have to be a little bit more careful about this first term you you can see actually this uh, this second term right here the one with the minus sign in front it uh, is going to end up giving us something that was exactly as what we had before in the, in the previous lecture. But this term now is a little bit trickier. And the reason it's trickier is the following. Um, before, uh, when we had Dirichlet boundary conditions at each boundary, we only used testing functions at the interior nodes. And therefore, every testing function that we used went to zero at both x equals l and x equals zero. So this term was always equal to zero. 
But now that we have a Norman boundary condition on the right hand side, uh, we need to test, we need to have a testing function at that last node as well. And of course the testing, so, so to look back up here at the picture, now the value of the function is no longer node, or excuse me, the, the value of the function is no longer known at this node, this last node. We know the derivative, but we don't know the value of the function. So since we don't know the value of the function, we need to test at that node, and the testing function at that node will have a value of 1 at that node and go down to 0 here at node n. So that testing function is definitely not equal to 0 at x equals l. Now all the other testing functions will go to 0 at x equals l and at x equals 0, but that, that one testing function, the testing function n plus 1, because that's node n plus 1, so testing function n plus 1 will have a value of 1 at x equals l and a value of 0 at x equals 0. So this term is going to be slightly different in that case from what it was before. And that's noted right here. We say if i is, is between 1 and n, the first term disappears. And that's because all of the first n testing functions go to 0 at both x equals 0 and at x equals l. But if i is equal to n plus 1, then that first test, that, that last testing function, the one at the rightmost boundary, it is equal to 1 at x equals l. So when we evaluate this, we will get tn plus 1 of l times dy dx of l minus tn plus 1 of 0, dy dx of 0. And so tn plus 1 of l, as we've already said, has a value of 1. dy dx of l is equal to b. That was the boundary condition we were talking about right up here, where this 0 should have been a b. Minus tn plus 1 of 0. Now testing function n plus 1 is the testing function over on the right-hand boundary. And so when we evaluate it at the left-hand boundary, we certainly do get 0. And then dy dx of 0, we don't know what that's equal to, but of course we don't need to either because 0 times uh, anything will be 0. So we have 1 times b minus 0 times an unknown, and so we just have b. So this term will be equal to b if i is equal to n plus 1, and it will be equal to 0 in all other cases, and we need to keep that in mind. Okay, so now, <clears throat> um, uh, proceeding in a uh, fashion that will remind you of exactly what we did uh, before, we have uh, y equals sum i equals zero to n plus one of ci bi of x, and as before, c zero is equal to a, but now all of the other c's are unknown. Remember, in the previous case, we knew c0 and we knew cn plus 1 uh, because we knew the uh, value of the unknown at both endpoints, but now we only know the value of the unknown uh, function at the left endpoint. So c0 is equal to a, we know that, but all the other c's are unknown, okay? And so we're gonna substitute that expression for y into this uh, differential equation. And remember now that we've already found that this first term, it can be summarized like this. So you have this little bracket, and it's zero if i is not equal to n plus one, b if i is equal to n plus one. And then I'll bring down this term, substituting for y, bring down this term, right, um, this uh, integral with a p coefficient, that's brought down right here, again, substituting for y. And uh, here's the integral for q is brought down right here. And of course, again, zero is brought down on the right-hand side. So now <clears throat> we will, um, oh, and let's see. I noticed another little error here. I should have a summation sign. I've dropped the summation signs out. Um, uh, actually, I noticed a couple of problems, okay. This should not be the sum i equals 0 to n plus 1. It should be sum j equals 0 to n plus 1. So fix that, sum j equals 0 to n plus 1, and this should be cj uh, bj of x. So, so make sure to make that substitution of index. This should be j rather than i. 
and also when I substitute that expression into uh, this equation for y, um, I uh, in accidentally dropped the summation signs out of these three integrals. No summation sign is needed over here. We've already taken care of this first term. We've discussed how to evaluate it, but I dropped the summation signs out of these uh, three uh, terms. So remember to put those summation signs in there and to uh, now notice that I have already changed the index to J. So you don't have to worry about that. You just need to change the index to J right there and there and there. But you also need to remember to put in the summation signs. OK. So now um, when we um, when we do that, put in the summation sign and do just a little bit of algebra. Actually, what we will do is um, just take that first term, take this term right here over to the right hand side. And uh, then for all the other terms, we're just going to factor out the CJ. And so we will get and notice now we have the summation back. So we have this and this looks extremely similar to what you had um, in the previous lecture. Uh, very, very similar. In fact, the left hand side is exactly what you had in the previous lecture. But now the right hand side, instead of being equal to zero, is equal to this. And um, so uh, if we if we let this bracketed term be mij, then this could be written much more compactly in this way. And um, um, now using the fact that C0, we know that C0 is equal to A. So we'll take C0, this, the, the term for J equals 0, we'll take that out of the summation as we did before. And uh, so now, and notice when we take that first term out, now the lower limit uh, lower uh, limit on this summation instead of j equals 0 is now j equals 1. So we have this. We'll take that over to the other side and, and, and also use the fact that c0 is equal to a. And so now here is the final form of our equation, which is exactly like what we had before, except that we now no longer have a uh, m n plus 1 times b term, but we have this instead. And notice that this is one equation in n plus 1 unknowns. The n plus 1 unknowns are c1 up to cn plus 1. And if we let i vary from 1 to n plus 1, we get n plus 1 equations and n plus 1 unknowns, which can be written in matrix form and solved. And so then everything else, so really just a slight difference here. Uh, from what we had before in order to do this problem um, with uh, Norman boundary condition at the right boundary. So that concludes this video and uh, good luck in, in doing this.